Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for your patience. Um, we are very happy to have Dr. Elena Suponina with us this morning, uh, this afternoon. As you can see, she's a rather busy person these days with all the activity that's going on uh, between Russia and the Middle East. She's advisor to the director of the Russian Institute for Strategic Studies, a think tank under the presidential administration of Russia. And she's the founding director of the Middle East and Asia Center, a research arm of the Russian Center for uh, Strategic and uh, Strategic in Institute. Um, she has been a journalist for many years with uh, Remya Novosti, Moskovsky Novosti, uh, and she traveled a lot with the uh, Russian president and Russian foreign ministers in their many trips abroad. She has interviewed and met uh, many eminent world leaders, including leaders of most Arab countries, presidents, heads of governments, foreign ministers, ministers of petroleum, energy, heads of intelligence services, and so on. She's obviously heard and seen a lot and I hope she will share with us at least 5% of what she knows, maybe 6%. Um, she has a PhD from the Russian Friendship University, and her dissertation was on the Druze, uh, who some of you may know live in the mountains of Syria, Lebanon, Israel, Palestine. They are a Shia offshoot of the Fatimids, uh, and they have an esoteric philosophy which includes elements of uh, Neoplatonism, reincarnation, maybe Buddhism, I don't know. They believe that Jesus will be born again in this world from a man. That's why they wear baggy pants. And some of them believe that good Druze uh, will be reincarnated in China. So as you can see, Dr. Elena is very well equipped to understand and help us understand the many strange paths taken uh, by Middle East uh, history and politics. Her research in interests include contemporary Middle Eastern and Asian issues, cooperation between Russia and the Middle East, uh, international mediation, counter-terrorism, foreign policy, international affairs, and she provides commentaries for Russian, Western, and Arab TV and radio uh, channels. She has received numerous uh, international and Russian awards for best publications in Islam in Russia, Russian-Arab cooperation, international policy, but the one I like best and am most keen to hear about is the Award for Courage from the Russian Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Yeah. Please welcome uh, Dr. Elena Sipodina. Thank you, Dr. Hu, for this nice uh, introduction. And uh, my last award uh, for the courage was uh, from Mr. Primakov, Russian uh, ex-prime minister. Uh, I'm sure you know about him. Uh, this right uh, institute is belonging to the Kremlin, and uh, a few days ago, uh, Reuters uh, agency. I'm not. I'm don't. I don't know why, but uh, accused our institute to, to be involved uh, in American elections, and uh, they said that we helped Mr. Putin to elect Mr. Donald Trump. Uh, so I think this is. Uh, it was a very difficult choice for us, but it's not true anyway. <laughs> uh, also, I'm not sure that good Druze uh, uh, can reincarnate uh, in China. Uh, maybe I was a Druze in my past reincarnations, uh, but uh, I was born in Russia anyway, and uh, I'm proud uh, of this. So I'm happy uh, to uh, have you with us uh, this day. I came directly from uh, Moscow and uh, we're still very busy uh, now with the Syrian crisis. Uh, and uh, I, I think I will speak about around uh, 30 minutes and uh, 40 minutes and uh, I will be glad to answer your questions if, uh, if you have. Uh, in recent years, Russia has been demonstrating uh, renewed political activity in the Middle East and North uh, Africa, taking an independent position on a range of issues which clashed uh, with the preferences of the United States. It most clearly demonstrated uh, in Syria. However, despite uh, these differences, in some occasions, uh, Moscow's policies even helped 
Americans to save face. Uh, for example, in the autumn of 2013, uh, the American president, uh, uh, ex-president Barack Obama, was already preparing uh, but loath to strike Syria when Russia promoted the initiative of destroying Syria's stockpile of chemical weapons. This proposal proved beneficial to the United States and other countries, especially in the Middle East. Now, U.S. and the new uh, elected president, Donald Trump, is demanding Russia to break with uh, Assad, the president of Syria. But in the contrary, American strikes on Syria now have injured Russia. Moscow is aware that the war is in Syria is not only about Assad. It's uh, not only about the, the power in Syria, but it's also about international order, and I think that Singapore is ent interested in uh, international order. Uh, this is also about the struggle against terror, about the role of uh, UN and Security Council. Uh, Russia is much more convinced that it's not political solution in Syria without eliminating or degrading, or degrading of Al-Qaeda and Daesh, or ISIS, and I prefer to name it Daesh, not ISIS, not Islamic State, because it's not state and it's not Islamic. It's not true Islamic. Uh, so Daesh is better, in our opinion. Uh, frequently speaking, some people, even in the Russian government, was expected from the President Donald Trump, which uh, our institute is accused to, to elect him, <laughs> but it's not true, I repeat in this, uh, to dedicate his uh, attention to the American uh, economy, to American uh, internal policy, uh, to the counter strategy, and to avoid an unnecessary involvement in wars. But after these Tomahawk strikes on Shirat base in Syria uh, on 7th of April, we have right to ask, what's the next? What's next? Uh, do you have any answer what, what's next after these strikes? Uh, somebody can tell me what's next, maybe? Uh, Ali, uh, what's, uh, have you any idea about uh, Donald Trump's strategy in Syria? <laughs> Off the record, uh, he's a vice captain, so. <laughs> Anybody, maybe? <laughs> uh, have you any answer? Is anything in uh, Donald Trump's mind what's next? Uh, for example, they strike Syria, Shirat base. What's next? Of, um, or, or maybe they want uh, for us to, to go, but what's next? Uh, the next day after Asset will be gone. Uh, I think uh, they don't have the answer. Donald Trump personally don't have the answer. And we in our institute, at least, we don't have an answer what Donald Trump's strategy towards Syria and towards the Middle East. We have very bad examples in Iraq, in Libya, and in both cases, it's not any clear answer. What after? Uh, Gaddafi is gone, but nobody knows who is taking the responsibility for the future of Libya, who is taking the responsibility for the future of Iraq. So now, who will take the responsibility for the future of Syria? Nobody knows. Uh, notice, by the way, that these strikes were made even without permission of Congress. I don't speak about the Security Council of UN, but even without permission of Congress. More dangerous than nobody, even I think Trump himself, knows the answer what's the next, and what is the strategy in Syria, and not only there. Yes, in any moment, the situation in Syria can deteriorate again. But it's necessary to not notice that despite recent developments, until now, Russia is aimed for a political solution to the Syrian war rather than a military escalation. Uh, Russia's policy in the Middle East are directly linked 
to Russia's international weight and its cultural and historical heritage. Russia, as you know, is the largest country in the world. Russia is also a sizable state in terms of population, almost 144 million, with more than 146 million following the reunification of the Crimea in the spring of 2014. Uh, reunification of Crimea. Russia is one of the five permanent veto powers in the UN Security Council. Russia is, after all, a nuclear power. Russia is one of three main oil producers, oil producers in the world, along with the United States and Saudi Arabia. Next to Iran and Qatar, Russia, is also, Russia also leads in terms of natural gas reserves. Uh, in this, the past decade, these riches have allowed Russia to maintain the status of an influential state. Of course, for many Middle Eastern states, Russia is not just a partner, but also a competitor. Uh, despite uh, the, now, now the fall in prices for oil and the introduction in 2014 of sanctions against Russia as a result of events in Ukraine, uh, uh, all these things are weakening Russia's potential on the global stage, including the Middle East, frequently speaking. But despite this, Moscow does demonstrate skill in its diplomacy especially considering its limited financial capabilities. Uh, and it's not an uh, easy task uh, to maintain this balance, to maintain a relationship with uh, Israel and Iran, with uh, Iran and Saudi Arabia, with uh, Iran and Turkey. Uh, for United States, it may be easier to criticize always Iran and to maintain relationship with Saudi Arabia only to maintain a relationship with Israel and at the same time to, uh, to avoid uh, the solution of Palestinian problem. Uh, Russia is trying to balance and it's very difficult and we do this without, uh, uh, without huge investments. Uh, and so I think it's really, uh, the demonstration of skill in our diplomacy. Um, I, wanted, I want to remember you that uh, Russia is a quite young state. Somebody is thinking about the Soviet Union, about, uh, about Tsarist Russia, but we are not. We are not the Soviet Union. We are not the Russia of Tsars. We are new, young state, a democratic state with a very old, huge, and rich history and culture. Uh, the leaders of the new Russia that was formed in uh, 1991 on a section of the former Soviet Union until very recently stressed that the country's external political interests should be pragmatic which is to say that the main aim should be the provision of security for its citizens and the creation of conditions for the receipt of economic benefits. This differs from the outlook of the Soviet epoch where partnership in many respects was ideological in nature. We are not ideological now, we are pragmatic. And uh, I think this is very good for our economy, for our people, uh, for our external policy, for our foreign policy. Uh, some people, uh, although the foreign policy of, po policy of post Cold War Russia is characterized by pragmatism rather than ideology, many high ranking Middle Eastern politicians always were and still see Moscow as being, being the same force it once was. I met many Middle Eastern politicians. <laughs> And uh, I know from them that sometimes uh, they prefer to play on the differences between the United States and Russia. And sometimes they are expecting more than we can provide for them. This is a mistake uh, because uh, uh, Russia really can say no to America, but we doesn't want to stand the new edition of Cold War again. In our opinion, it's better to cooperate 
uh, even it's better to cooperate with the United States and with other Western countries. Uh, and we can cooperate, for example, against uh, terror. In May 2016, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov has proposed to Americans to liberate Raqqa together. Raqqa is the main city of uh, Daesh in Syria. So why not to do this together? We are ready. But until now, there is not the answer from Washington. Uh, Barack Obama didn't answer it, but Donald Trump also is not answering until now. And it's strange because we have, uh, even recently, we have very good example, uh, examples in counter st strategy in the Middle East. For example, in uh, June of, uh, in summer of 2014, when jihadists from the Islamic State from Daesh threatened to move towards Baghdad, Russia then supplied Iraqi government with, uh, uh, with uh, much needed uh, jets. Not so new, but uh, it was needed and the Iraqi government used it against Daesh and uh, stopped them uh, nearby from Baghdad. Uh, Ex-Iraqi uh, Prime Minister Nuri Maliki, and I know him personally, he called uh, this time uh, both uh, Barack Obama and Vladimir Putin. Uh, and Barack Obama didn't help. Why? Uh, because uh, uh, United States, states uh, instead of assist Iraqi government, was plan planning the resignation of Nuri Maliki. Yes, maybe Mr. Maliki was corrupted, um, but who is not corrupted in the Middle East now? <laughs> maybe, maybe he made uh, many mistakes, but uh, despite this, Russia helped him because uh, the more danger was to see Daesh uh, advancing toward Baghdad. But Americans, they didn't. And in my opinion, this is a mistake. And uh, the second mistake uh, was uh, not only to help, not to help Iraqi government this time and to let Daesh uh, to uh, occupy uh, Mosul and other cities. The other mistake was not to cooperate with Russia. Until now, we're ready to cooperate. And uh, I think, uh, uh, I think uh, we still hope <laughs> that Americans will respond. Uh, I only, I also I want to, to, uh, to remember you that uh, during perestroika and during Soviet time, the Russian policy in the Middle East was different from now. Uh, for example, uh, now certain things were changed. Uh, thus, in 1990 and 1991, Moscow restored its relationship with Saudi Arabia, broken from 1930s. Also, during the Soviet period, from the summer of 1967 to the autumn of 1991, Moscow didn't maintain diplomatic relations with Israel, though it restored them afterwards in uh, 1991. As I was told in this context by the former USSR Minister of Foreign Affairs, Alexander Besmertnik, uh, under whom relations with this state, with Israel, began to be reestablished, uh, Russia, without official links with Israel and by maintaining relations only with the Arabs for a long time from 19, 1967 until 1991, uh, was just standing on one leg in the Middle East. Now we are standing on two legs uh, in the Middle East. Uh, Muslim world, world and also Israel. Uh, Russia has good relations, relations with Israel and going to keep this level of mutual understanding. But Russia is remembering also that uh, it's, uh, it will be no stability in the Middle East without the state of Palestine. 
This is Russian position today about this. We know that American policy toward Palestine may be changing now. Donald Trump is ready to speak about, again, once again, about one state. I remember then once uh, Muammar Gaddafi uh, named this state <laughs> uh, Israel. He took Israel, the word of Israel, and Palestine. And he said that the future of Palestine and Israel will be Israel, Israel-Palestine state. Uh, I don't believe that it's possible. No any Israel. Uh, I don't believe that it's possible to create one state instead of uh, two states. Maybe Jared Kushner and Donald Trump, they believe in this. Uh, we are not. We think that uh, Palestinians has, uh, have right to create their own state, Palestine. And uh, we are waiting for the visit of uh, Mahmoud Abbas, the president of Palestine, uh, at 11th of May to Moscow. And uh, we still hope that uh, our initiative about uh, bilateral talks between uh, Netanyahu and Abbas in Moscow still relevant. Uh, Palestinians uh, uh, agreed on this proposal, and we are waiting the res uh, response from uh, uh, Israel Prime, Mi Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. We are ready for these talks in Moscow. Uh, so unlike the United States, Israel, and the European Union, Russia also doesn't consider the Palestinian Hamas movement or the Lebanese Hezbollah organization as terrorist. Russia has maintained relations with these movements. And this is a difference in our policy uh, from American or European policy. In the Middle East, we have good relationship with Hamas and Hezbollah. Sometimes uh, Israel uh, is asking us to put this organization in our, uh, on our blacklist, but until now, we're not. Uh, by this, Moscow is trying to create this, the balance of powers in the Middle East, uh, uh, maintaining relationship with Israel and Palestine, uh, with Iran and Saudi Arabia and Turkey and Qatar. And in the summer of 2005, Russia was granted observer status in the organization of the Islamic Conference, now the organization uh, of uh, uh, Islamic Cooperation. And two years earlier, in 2003, the Russian President Vladimir Putin even took part in a summit of this organization uh, nearby uh, of you in Malaysia. Uh, critics, some Arabs among them, sometimes accuse Russia of siding with the Shiites, of uh, or becoming a spoke in the Shiite axis, and dub Russia's foreign minister as Ayatollah Lavrov. These unjust charges are explained by the fact that some Arabs are negatively disposed towards the partnership between Russia and Iran, as well as their support for the government of Syria. In some articles, one can encounter odd things, for example, Sunni America and Europe against Shiite Russia. China is sometimes included here in Shiite. Uh, axis. It, this, this is strange, but uh, I read many articles in Saudi press, even in Europe press, in American press about this. The authors justify this on the basis that in the Syrian conflict, Russia supports Syria and Iran, while Europe and the United States support Sunni states such as Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and Turkey. But in this strange way, they forget then Egypt, that Egypt, this old Russia's partner, it's not Shiite, but mostly Sunni country, like many others. Also, this year, Russia created uh, the partnership in Astana, uh, the capital of Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan, this is uh, ex-Soviet Republic, now independent state, and Kazakhstan mostly Sunni. Uh, and uh, this partnership between uh, Iran and Turkey and Russia, uh, in my opinion, it's very unique. 
and uh, it was uh, much more better than even talks in Geneva. Uh, Astana process, it's not alternative for Geneva. We need to maintain uh, Geneva process uh, about Syria, but uh, the same time, time parallel, uh, we need to maintain uh, talks, talks in Astana because uh, we have the uh, military leaders from Syrian opposition, we have uh, Iranian influence on Syrian government, and we have Turkish influence on Syrian opposition. Uh, so we need even Americans and maybe uh, Gulf states to participate in such process. Despite recent strikes on Syria from Americans, we think that it's possible to continue Astana process because it's not, not any uh, real alternative to this. Well, what's the alternative? Alternative is the continuation of this crisis and deterioration. Uh, if no, not talks in Geneva of Ast or Astana, it means uh, that uh, war in Syria will continue and it can lead us uh, to dividing of the state. And this is very dangerous. Uh, this is very dangerous not only for Syria, it's also dangerous for Iran, for Iraq, for Turkey, because Turkey has uh, uh, many Kurds, millions of Kurds, and uh, in uh, Ankara they understand that any uh, division of Syria can lead finally uh, to the weakness of Turkey as a United States, as a United States. So uh, also why Russia is not uh, the part of sheet uh, axis, uh, uh, we understand the danger of re religious conflicts. Uh, we understand the necessity of uh, protection of national and uh, religious communities. Uh, the position of the Christian min minority in Syria and Iraq now is very grave, and uh, yet the international community has not paid enough attention to this issue. In no way does Russia, with some 13 at least to 20 million Muslims at home, wish to be immersed in interreligious conflicts in the Middle East. And most of all Muslims, they are Sunni. Uh, uh, between uh, uh, 20 million uh, Muslims in Russia, only uh, 3 million are Shiite. Some of them uh, in, mostly in Dagestan Republic, uh, the part of Russia, but mostly of them are Sunni. So Russia can't stand against Sunni words. We're together with Shia, with Sunnah, with Christians, and this is very important. Uh, rather, Moscow is concerned to maintain, in so far as this it is possible, the balance of power and relationships in the Middle East. Uh, most importantly, Russia sees uh, its mission in the Middle East to be the active uh, pursuit of the principles of international law, believing that it's better to prevent another war than to help its victims. Uh, so Russia's foreign ministry in, in the Middle East uh, is principled and independent. And uh, we still hope that US-Russian coordination in the fight against ISIS and uh, Jabhat al-Nusra, or Jabhat Fatah al-Sham, as uh, they named it's, uh, they themselves uh, recently, is possible. Also, the role of Iran and Turkey remains critical in any effort to de-escalate the violence in Syria. There are areas of coordination on which all could agree. First of all, this is cessation of hostilities. Secondly, humanitarian assistance. And the third, peace negotiations. Nobody disagree on these three points. We can disagree about the future of uh, the president of Syria. We can disagree about uh, government institutions in Syria. 
but these three points, cessation of hostilities, humanitarian assistance, and peace negotiations, nobody disagree on it. We hope that despite, despite recent Trump strikes, the US and Russia share the view that de-escalation in Syria is better for regional stability and for US-Russia relations. Yes, the lack, the leak of trust is serious obstacle, but Moscow's ba based, uh, Moscow best scenario in Syria is to achieve national reconciliation through a power sharing agreement between the different political and social components. The aim also to keep state institutions in Syria, to keep Syrian army, the best part of Syrian army, not to repeat uh, mistakes that Americans made in Iraq when they dissolved Ba'ath Party and uh, when and the officers of the army and they created the vacuum and this vacuum, who filled this vacuum? ISIS. Uh, so it's very important not to repeat these mistakes and uh, also it's very important to work together uh, and to prevent the dividing, the dividing of Syria and its territorial integrity. Uh, and to conclude, I'm gonna repeat once again uh, that to define the rules of the game in the Middle East, it means to define the rules of the game in the entire of the world, including Asia. Thank you and uh, I'm ready to answer your questions. <laughs>